of the bulletin. We got to load up here on the screen. If y'all can see that, that's good. Um, but I'll uh, I'll uh, just kind of do it without in such a way so y'all don't have to refer to anything. Let's go to the Lord in prayer though, and uh, welcome Him here in this place, Father. Uh, once again, we come to you, and at this time in our service, Lord, as we go into the sermon. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive from your word. Lord, the words that are given to us in the scripture are living words. Father, they bring life, Lord, and they cut us and, uh, Lord, shape us into what type of person we need to be. Lord, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. So, Lord, I just pray that uh, we would allow ourselves to be cut and shaped this morning and Lord I pray that uh, as we uh, look at its pages that we would not leave here today the same as when we came that we would be changed and be more transformed into the image of your son Father we love you and thank you and praise you in Jesus name Amen So our question for today this is uh, part of the Q&A sermon series question that I'm going to look at today is this, and again, if you can read it on the screen, that's great, but I'm going to go ahead and read the question. The title of our sermon today is called Secret Faults and Other Sins, and here's the question that was posed. It says, if you happen to have done any kind of sin in the past but forgot to repent, does that mean you still go to heaven if you repent for other sins? I'll read it again. If you happen to have done any kind of sin in the past but forgot to repent, does that mean you still go to heaven if you repent for other sins? And there's a scripture that touches on this, and I'm going to, I'll go ahead and read it to start with. Uh, it's from the New King James Version of Scripture. We're going to, I'm going to read Psalms Chapter 19, verses 7 to 12. And this is how it reads. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandments of the Lord are the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And then verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. If I were holding my hand the Bible, and you look at its pages, and the thickness of the book, more than half of it is Old Testament. Probably two-thirds of the book is from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament contains within it different sections. There's historical, and there is uh, poetic and prophetic. And then there's a section about the law. And the law to the Jewish people, God's chosen people, the law was given to them to teach them what it takes to have relationship with God if we could do it ourselves. That's, that is how it would have to be. God's laws stand as a representation of the holiness of God. And if we in and of ourselves we're going to be holy enough for God we would have to know and keep every day of our lives everything that is written in the Old Testament verse 8 the statutes of the Lord are right 
Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. And the testimony of the Lord is true. The scripture contains all of this. And there is perfection in what it says in its pages. Because our God is a perfect being. Human beings, on the other hand, are not perfect beings. We were given a freedom of choice. And that's what we talked about last Sunday, our ability to make, cho to make choices. And you remember, you have to have at least one bad choice or you really don't have any choice at all. That free will that we as human beings all enjoy, it's both a blessing and it's a cursing. Because Adam and Eve made the wrong choice and we, as a result, are not able to have the perfection that we would need to have a relationship with God. That's what makes it so important to have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. But verse 12 captures part of the answer to the question that was asked, what if you happen to have done any kind of sin in the past but forgot to repent? Let me read verse 12 again. Who can understand his errors Cleanse me from secret faults. It is impossible for us to comprehend the depth of sin that is in our heart. We can't understand everything that's lurking around in our hearts because, and once again, as human beings, we have, we have a lot of failures and one of them is short memory. The older I get, the shorter my memory gets. And I'm at that age now where I can remember what I did when I was in high school, but I can't remember what I ate for breakfast this morning. You know, y'all will get there. You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Mm -hmm. No, you don't have a clue? <laughs> Dietrich, you're shaking your head. Are you familiar with this condition? That, uh, been there, done that. Been there, done that? We have short memory. Now, I think really hard, I can remember maybe what I did, you know, on the last time we went on vacation. Sheila and I were very fortunate to be able to go on two vacations this year. I mean, I'm blessed. And thank the Lord for that. But, you know, ask me what I did on a vacation 10 years ago, and I'll be like, uh, what? I mean, hard to remember back. I remember as a child... We used to pile into Mom's VW van and we'd go up to the Smokies and I, I remember that so well because I get so hot in the summertime. And we, when we'd pile in that van, I was happy because we lived in a mobile home and just had one little windy unit air conditioner to try and cool the whole house. And my bedroom was in the butt end of that trailer and it got like an oven in there for it to heat and heat. But we'd pile in that van and we'd head up to the Smokies We'd get under that canopy of trees and it'd be 30 degrees cooler. Mm -hmm. It'd be 70 up there and a nice chill in the, in the air under those trees. And especially if you went up on top up there at Clinton's Dome, you, you, could, you could need a coat in some time up there. It's chilly. I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Very fond memories of that childhood. Oh, she got her hand up. You, you, oh, you know? Do you, remember, do you remember us going out to the Smokies in that VW van? I, I remember. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. I, I loved it. I loved it. But we cannot remember all the things that are in our hearts that were that, that are sin. Who can remember the the first time you stole something. Anybody remember the first time they stole something? Every, every kid does that. You remember the first thing you stole, don't you? Mother? Talking. Yeah. Talking. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember that. You remember, what was it, a candy bar or something? No, uh, I was in a furniture store and those old lamps that used to be popular back then. I stole the key off of one of those holes. You did. Because mine was 
still we're getting for it. Oh my goodness gracious. Well, I know once God forgives you and you truly repent, He forgives you, but you know, it's hard to forget it out of your mind. Well, you know, that's right. You know, if you were to ask God about it, say, Lord, do you remember that time that I stole that key from that piece, from that lamp? He'd look at you and he'd go, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Isn't that wonderful? He's forgotten. He forgets it. He forgives and forgets. But we remember sometimes. But we have a hard time remembering everything we've done. Who can understand his errors? And Because if you can't remember what you've done, it's a secret fault. It's something hidden inside our heart. Listen to Psalm 58, verse 3. This is from the International Reader's Version. It says, Even from birth, those who are evil go down the wrong path. From the day they are born, they go the wrong way and spread lies. Babies, when they come out of the womb, are speaking lies. Now, if you if you've had a child, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night, well, well, wants to be fed, right? And you go feed them. And then not not long enough later that they're hungry again, well, well. And they're not hungry, but they cry and like they're hungry. You ever experienced that with Megan? Don't remember? That's a secret thing, ain't it? Because you don't forgot it. Anybody remember that? Babies will cry when they're hungry. And that's when they're supposed to cry. But sometimes they just cry because they want attention. And so if it cries and it knows you'll come... Well, they learn to cry when they don't need anything. They just want you to come and take them up home. Well, that's a lie, is it not? Hey, I'm hungry. You're not hungry. No, I just want to be healed. That's a lie. Did you did you ever have any, did you ever have any of your little babies lie to you? I'm sorry. I said, did any of your babies lie to you when they were babies? Were they lie to me? No, did they lie? Did they, did they cry like they was hungry, but they really just wanted to be held? Well, yeah. Uh -huh. and they know when, you, when they cry, you won't have to take them out uh -huh. and give them a lot of That's right. That's a lie. I'm hungry. <laughs> now, if I cry, I'm hungry. I usually am. That's just me. But little babies, it says right here, from birth, they spread lies. And it's true. As little babies, we learned it too. When we would cry, we'd get attention. So we'd cry when we were hungry, and we'd cry when we just wanted attention. It's a lie. Babies even do it. And as adults, we do the same thing. We, we lie when we want something. It happens. But it just goes to show... I don't remember what I was like when I was a baby, but I understand that's what basically all babies do. And so we, we carry around with us sins, and they're from a long time ago. Remember in high school, we'd pull pranks on each other, and we'd, we'd, do, we'd do mean things to each other. I mean, do you remember all those? Did you ask God to forgive you of all those? Probably not. But we did them. And sometimes we get together, we'll remember what I've been, we'll smile a little bit to go, hey, that guy got me, so I got him back. And that girl got me, I got him back. Whatever. In our heart, we carry around things like that and we don't even know about it. And they're sins, and they're secret sins because we forgot about them. But what did the psalmist do in Psalm 19? He prayed, cleanse me from my secret sins. That's a prayer that we should all pray once in a while. God, I don't, I don't remember all the bad things I've done, but Father, forgive me. 
please cleanse me of those things that I can't even remember that I've done wrong. And it's a simple thing. You don't, you don't have to make a big deal about it because we've all been there. We've all done it. We all carry the garbage around with us. And sometimes we still do it. Sometimes we might not still realize that we're doing it. You know, like when you're driving around. And sometimes don't we get mean when we're driving around? It's like, you know, you pull up to that guy and he's in next to you at the traffic light. And his, his windows rolled up, your windows rolled up, and you can hear still that. And you're like, yeah, I think I'll just burn my gun and get, get it in front of him or whatever. You get that guy that's wanting to pass you and he's driving you crazy and then and then you get the opportunity to get on Chapman Highway, you know, they've, they've changed it from four lanes to three and so now you can get up in there and if you go the speed limit, you'll get an entourage behind you because everybody's wanting to go faster than you and if you're in the, if you're in the pole position, they got to go as slow as you do. <laughs> yeah, it feels pretty good to have, a, I always like to have an entourage with me whenever I go. I'm just obeying the law. But you get that little bit of a little bit of pleasure that you make everybody go a little bit slower than I want. Hey, that's a secret sin. Lord, forgive me of my secret sins, my secret faults. We all have them. Whatever your hang-ups are, we all have them. But they're secret faults. But we don't have to live with them. We can ask God to forgive us for them. Now, there's also sins that you can do that you even don't even have a clue that you've done. Now those, you know, remember, you know, stealing something when we was little or cutting somebody off in traffic or whatever. I mean, we, we know we did those. We might not think about them. They don't even rise to the level of, oh, I've got to get on my knees and pray about it right now. You know, but you think about it later or you just say, Lord, cleanse me of those later. And... We know about those, but there's, there's sins that you maybe have done that you don't even have a clue you've done. Luke 17, verses 3 to 4. Listen to this. If your, but this is Jesus talking. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back saying, I repent, you must for forgive them. Now, if, you, if you've heard me preach in any length of time, you're likely to hear that one again because I, I preach that one a lot because other preachers don't. What's the first step to forgiving? To the process of forgiveness. The first step is rebuke. Other preachers don't preach that. They say, oh, just forgive. Somebody, somebody cuts you off drinking. Oh, I'll just forget. Oh, somebody puts a puts a frog in your locker. At, you know, when you kid, I'll oh, just forgive them, or whatever. Somebody shortchanges you, or jumps in front of you at the supermarket, or whatever, whatever turns you off. Just, I'll just forgive. That's not what Jesus said to do. He said, rebuke them. Hey, I was in line. Get behind me. Now, why did Jesus say to do that? Because, look at verse Luke 17, 3 to 4, once again, if your brother or sister sins against you, they have committed a sin against you, and they might not have even known they did it. So the reason for the rebuke is to let them know that they did it. So, I'm not, I'm not a well-known individual, but I've, I've met people over the years going to different churches, and I'll be going through a grocery store or something, and somebody will see me and they'll recognize me, and I might be oblivious. You know, I get tunnel vision when i got to remember five items to get, because my memory's bad, so I focus, okay, I get the bread, the bread and the milk and the juice and the whatever, and I'm tunnel vision. And if somebody sees me in the store and I don't talk to them, they might think I'm mad at them. This actually happened to me a couple weeks ago. I was in Kroger. And an old friend of ours, James Solomon, was in the store. And I was walking down the aisle and I just tunnel vision. I'm going to my next thing because I'm trying to remember my grocery list. And he passed me and in the corner of my eye I saw this guy kind of looking at me like, 
Well, you little thing, you. Like, here I am, your friend, and you didn't say hi to me. And I, I passed him a time or two because I, I go over here and get something, I go over here and get something, and it just seemed like we ran into each other a couple times. And then finally I heard him say, hey, dude, just real soft. It's like, hey, wait a minute, I heard my name. And I turned around, and then, then I recognized him. James, how you doing, my brother? I didn't even see you there. Now, I've missed him three or four times. But you know what? I could have walked out of that store and not recognized him, not heard my name, and not looked at him. And I could have heard him very badly, but I wouldn't have even known him. Wouldn't have, I mean, I wouldn't have had any fault because I'm just, I didn't see him, didn't recognize him. And I'm glad that he said, hey, David. I'm saying my name real soft if you can't hear it. Hey, David. Like that. But it's soft. Hey, David. And if he hadn't said nothing, he would have walked out of there thinking David didn't love him no more. And I would have sinned against him, but I had I was completely innocent because I had no idea how to even done it. And so who do it was not really a rebuke, but that was kind of the same thing. I didn't know I had done anything wrong until he said something. Now really he should have said, hey David, are you ignoring me? You were offending me. And that would have been fine too. But who do it was enough. I stopped. I realized, hey, I'm sorry, man. I didn't see you there. I heard you, and I recognize that. And and the words was, I mean, it was carried in my words that, that there needed to be forgiveness there. Except it hadn't got kind of that far enough yet, I don't guess. I don't know if he was hurt yet. But I saw him, I recognized him, and and so we had a good conversation. I think. I think he was kind of wishing that he hadn't said nothing because I talked his ear off, you know. <laughs> so maybe he wished he'd just kept going. Instead, he got about a 15 minute conversation out of me. I don't remember, now I'm trying to remember. She was sitting out in the car waiting on me when I had a 15 minute conversation. But anyway, maybe I, maybe, I need to, maybe I need to repeat it over there too. Anyway, the point of it is. Not only are there sins in our life that we know we did, but they, they, they end up getting lost between the cracks and they fall down deep in our heart and we don't even know they're there anymore. We have to repent of those. Lord, forgive me of secret sins. This is a type of a sin that we just have no clue that we, we have done unless somebody calls our attention to it. That's why it's so important to the forgiveness process of why Jesus said, if your brother offends you, rebuke him. Let him know about it. Because otherwise, you're just carrying around hurt and there's a sin that happened and I didn't even know about it. Or the person that hurt you, they may not even know about it. So, it's possible to sin and not know it. And so we need to let people know. So that way it's not still a secret sin. I'm going to go back to the fill in the blank here. See if everybody's paying attention. No one can fully blank the extent of the sin in their heart. What was that? Understand. Nobody can fully understand the extent of the sin in their heart. There's a lot of stuff lurking around in there. We just have to ask God to forgive us for it. Babies come forth from the womb blank, blank. They are blanking blanks, speaking lies. Who could possibly remember every sin we've done if we came out of our mother's womb and we were speaking lies? We were sinning even as babies. We can't remember all that. But it is possible to sin against someone and not even know it. We blank the offender as a first step towards forgiveness for this very reason. We rebuke them. That's right. Okay, so let me read the question again. If you have happened to have done any kind of sin in the past but forgot to repent, does that mean you still go to heaven if you repent for other sins? Well, you need to repent for those secret sins. But if you can't remember what they are, just say, Lord, be like the psalmist. Lord, forgive me of my secret sins. And just let that be a part of your, your, your everyday prayer. 
Because we do it, we do stuff and sometimes we don't realize it, or we do stuff and we don't even know it happened. So God, forgive me of my secret sins. We can repent of them even if we don't know them or remember them. Okay. So what about repenting for other sins? So the word other sins is in the question too. So i got another little section here called other sins. And uh, Matthew 15 to 19 is our first scripture that now I got these scriptures side by side in the bulletin because they, they're from two different places in the Bible but they, they connect and they help us to understand one another so Matthew 15 and 19 which is on the left side it says for out of the heart come bad thoughts killing other people sex sins of married person sex sins of a person not married stealing, lying and speaking against God. That's the New Life version of Scripture. For out of the heart come bad thoughts. Everybody say bad thoughts. Bad thoughts. Now 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5, also from the New Life version, says we break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself against the wisdom of God. And we take hold of every thought and make it obey Christ. Say every thought. Every thought. We have got to take control of what comes into our mind. Now we can't help what comes into our mind. Because our mind is constantly working and thinking of things. When you dream at night, you can't help what you dream. And while you're awake, your mind is thinking of stuff, and you can't help what enters your mind, okay? The devil can't read your mind, but I think the devil can kind of plant little subliminal messages in there. Thoughts enter our mind, and we can't help it. Because we have five senses, right? We have eyes that can see, we have ears that can hear, and we have a tongue that can taste, and a nose that can smell, and skin that can touch. And when those things perceive the outside world, where does it go? Those signals all go to our brain or into our mind. And our mind is processing what comes in from the outside. So if you come into a place where there's something that is very pleasurable to you, to your eyes. It's going to your brain, right? Well, if it's a, if it's something good to look at, like a piece of art, that's you know a, a countryside or some some uh, Norman Rockwell painting, you know, of kids playing or whatever. Or, you know, it's a good movie like the Jesus, the Chosen movie that's coming around. If that kind of stuff is entering our eyes, then that goes into our brain. And those are good thoughts. But if something comes to us that taints us, then that's going to enter our minds too. Maybe we can't help it. Maybe, the, maybe the, we were flipping channels and there was something on TV we shouldn't have seen. And, oh, that entered our mind. We can't help what goes into our mind. But once it becomes a thought then we need to put a lid on it and control our thoughts. We break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself up against the wisdom of God. And we take hold of every thought. Everybody say, every thought. Come on, everybody say it. Every thought. And make it obey Christ. So from the heart come bad thoughts. But we need to take control of every thought. Now I start with this because we're talking about other sins besides the secret sins. So other sins besides the secret sins are sins that we know about. And if you know about a sin, it's something that you ought to try to avoid. Should you not? That's controlling those thoughts because that's where sins begin. And that's why we should think on good things. Philippians 4.8 from the King James 
It says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Controlling those thoughts means filling our head and our eyes and our ears with good things. So put on some Christian music. Let your eyes take in something that you attribute to God, like the beauty of nature or something like that. When you read, read things that are good to read. If you, you know, the Bible is a really good place to start, but there's other good things to read out there. Whatsoever things are just. I began to wonder, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a watcher of the news, and there's a lot of injustice in the world. Sometimes I think maybe I ought to tone down on the news a little bit. Whatsoever things are pure and lovely. Think about that special person that's special to you. Good memories or memories to be made. Think about lovely things. But think about things that have virtue and are praise to God. If we fill our minds with those things, it will help us to control those thoughts. Because thoughts will get us in trouble or they can help protect us. Depends on what we put into our minds. When we're talking about sin, and sin begins with temptation, and temptation begins with those thoughts. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. I hardly ever quote from the Darby translation, but I thought it said it best. Let no man being tempted say, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil things, and himself tempts no one. But everyone is tempted and drawn away and enticed by his own lust. Then lust, having conceived, gives birth to sin, but sin, fully completed, brings forth death. So you have a thought, and a thought can include lust, and lust leads to sin, and sin leads to death. That is a process. You don't just immediately jump to doing sin. Almost never. The process of going from having a right relationship with God to being backslid is a really slow process. To go through the process of lust and temptation to sin and on to death, it's something that takes a little while. Usually. It should be a slow process. Maybe sometimes we're on the express train to sin, but I hope not. It's a process that if we're living the way we should live, if we have the kind of relationship with God that we should have, it should be a slow process. You know, in the Christian world, there's all these arguments that happen between different denominations, and they talk about, you might have heard the term, once saved, always saved. And then you have on the opposite extreme, there's Christians that... You know, they say, hey, when you're in church, you're, you're good to go, but walk out that door and you might stub your toe and fall over and curse on your way down and hit yourself on a rock and die and you go to hell because you cursed on your way down and hit that rock. I mean, they just see it as you can lose your salvation over a blink of an eye. And those are two really wildly, wildly distant uh, extremes. Nothing can remove you from God's hand or on the other side, you could lose your salvation in an instant. Man, that's really extreme. The truth of the matter is that to go from a point where you are in a good standing with God to a point to where you're not, that's a slow process. If you are living life as a Christian the way you should, it's a slow process. Let me read it again. Verse 14, everyone is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own lust. Then lust, having conceived, gives birth to sin. How long is it in the human body 
from conception to birth. When you're having a baby, how long does that take? Nine months. Nine months. Now James compares this process of going from being, being in a right righteous state to a point of death. He compares that to birth. He compares that from, the, from conception to the time the baby's ready to be born and, and is born. That's, how, that's what he compares this process to. So don't think of it as, you know, you can lose your salvation in an instant. I don't see that happen. Because a birth is a long process. It takes a while. But I wouldn't say it's the same thing as once saved, always saved, because as we talked about in a previous Sunday, Solomon, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, who was at the same time dumb as a box of rocks because he had a thousand wives and he let those wives lead him away from God. He was so close to God that God asked him anything he wanted. And Solomon said, give me knowledge and wisdom to understand how to rule this kingdom. And God gave him that plus all the riches and he was the envy of the world. But in the end, the man lost his salvation because he left God and he started worshiping idols. And the last part of his life, he had completely walked away from God. So if the greatest, wisest man who ever lived can lose his salvation, man, I, I, I better watch out because I'm not smart like he was. But I hope I got enough sense not to have a thousand wives to let them lead me away. I mean, so I'm a little smarter than a box of rocks. How would you say that? Did he have book learning and didn't have any didn't have any common sense? Maybe that was it. That's I've heard that saying before. Too much book learning, not enough. Too much book learning, not enough streetwise, eh? So we're somewhere in between. It's a process. And here is the scripture. It is a process. It's like giving birth. It takes a little while to wear you down. If you are, you got the Christian music playing, you are reading the scriptures, you're doing everything you can, and your, your mind is stayed upon Him, but then, for reasons you can't help, you got tempted. Your thoughts you started to lose control of your thoughts. When you, when you are applying yourself and you're controlling your thoughts, you're guarding your heart. You're guarding your mind. You are, you are protecting yourself from the devil. But when you start to lose control of what your mind is thinking, that is what lust is. When you begin to lose control of what you're thinking, so you're trying your best to concentrate on the words of that latest song from Hill Songs or whatever, you know, Chris Tomlin or whoever you listen to, and you're listening to it on the radio, and you're trying to concentrate, but then in the back of your mind, you start thinking about that sinful thing that is tempting you. That thing that you like to look at or that person you like to talk to or that thing that tries to lead your heart away from God. And you're focusing on that Christian music or whatever it is you're doing, but in the back of your mind, that thought starts to invade, that bad thought. When you begin to lose control of what you're thinking, that is lust. And your lust is then starting to take control. And as much as it is within you, push that thought out of your mind. Don't dwell on it. Don't think about it. Don't try and do your best to capture your mind and bring it under subjection. But if you begin to lose control of your mind, that, that is what lust is. Your body is winning the battle over your will to follow the Lord. Now temptation is something that happens should happen again if you're walking as a Christian the way you should. Temptation is something that should be not a short process. You shouldn't be tempted and then immediately fall. 
You should have some strength about you and, and exercise yourself. Put on your spiritual armor. Make every preparation. And if it's going to win out over you, make it, make it earn it. Fight it and fight it and fight it. But we're talking about sins and we all have them. So inevitably there's going to come a moment when your weakness reveals itself and you give in to that thought. Now if you sit there and you think about a thought for a few minutes and then you get back your mind back on the Lord, guess what's going to happen tomorrow? It's going to come back. You're going to think about it a little bit more. And the next day you're going to think about it a little bit more. And temptation is a process that could happen a long, over a long period of time. Maybe there is another person that tempts you. You want to spend more time with them instead of more time with your spouse. And so, you know, that person works at the coffee shop. And, you know, I think I'll go in there and get my coffee over here today. You know, there's a bunch of other places to go get your coffee. But you find yourself going into that coffee shop where that person is. And you should stay away from them. But you, you start developing a life for that coffee. It's not the coffee. Temptation can be something that happens over a long period of time. Maybe you start thinking, oh, I can handle it. But if you put yourself in that situation over and over and over again, and you don't take control over it, you don't get a rein on it, then somewhere it ceases to be temptation and it becomes sin. Because you're more than just letting your eyes look on it or you're letting your ears listen to it or whatever, eventually you will allow your body to participate in an act that is not right. That goes against God's law. His law which is perfect. And you become the person of sin. And maybe that sin goes on for a long period of time. You know, once you start doing sin... It's easy to do it the second time. It's easier to do it the third time. Because you've given in to it. And eventually, just like that baby being born, the process of being pregnant eventually reaches its end around the ninth month. That sin will bring death into your life. Things that you did not want to have happen will happen. If your temptation is food, maybe that health condition finally sets in. If you're a smoker, maybe that lung condition finally sets in. Whatever your sin that you're doing, sin is sin because it will bring a negative effect in your life. It will eventually destroy something that is important. Sin, when it is fully completed, brings forth death. Whatever it is, if you don't get control of it, eventually it will bring the terrible negative result in your life that you don't, that you, you dreaded to see. First Corinthians 10 and 13. This is from the ERV, the easy to read version. Again, I don't quote from it very much, but I thought it said it the best. The only temptations that you have are the same temptations that all people have. But you can trust God that He will not let you be tempted more than you can bear. But when you are tempted, God will always give you a way to escape that temptation. Then you will be able to endure it. First line that the devil tells you when you're tempted is you the only one going through this situation. He'll say nobody understands what you're going through because you're the only one that's affected by this problem. You, nobody else will understand. Nobody else will come close. Nobody can give you advice. Nobody can, you know, if they try to tell you something, they don't really understand the situation, so what they're telling you is worthless. Only you are going through this. Nobody else can grasp it. You're in a unique situation. 
Anything the devil can tell you to justify what you're doing. If you find yourself in that coffee shop and you're with someone, you're buying that coffee because not for the coffee, but for that person that you want to see, they'll say, oh, you're having troubles at home that nobody can understand. And it's okay. Or somebody might tell you that. If you do confide in an individual and you say, I just, I'm not happy in the situation I'm at and I need this. What do you think God thinks? Inevitably, somebody is going to use the words, it's okay for you to do what you're doing. God understands. Everybody say, God understands. God understands. If you hear those words come out of somebody's mouth, let me give you a piece of advice. Run. Those are the magic words that you should listen for always. And the person that says, it's okay, God understands, you run from them. They are a demon in disguise. You run from them. Because that's all, from, from what I've seen, that's the magic words that always get spoken it's okay, God understands. God understands one thing. His law. And His law says you should be doing one thing. And that's what He understands. He don't understand why you have to break His law. So don't let anybody tell you, oh, it's okay, God understands. You run from that person. Everybody say, run. Say it loud, Run. The truth is that if you find yourself in a place that you ought not be, God's going to make a way for you to make a choice to exit from that place and get out of there. He's going to make a way where you can get out. Now, I didn't think too much on my coffee example to kind of Think of a good way to explain that. But if you're somewhere where you ought not be, maybe that way out is somebody comes walking in who knows you and knows a little bit about your situation or they are in a position where they could rat you out. Maybe you almost got caught. And maybe that's your little clue that the gig is up and you need to walk out of there. Maybe you see something in the situation that isn't right. And something on your shoulder says, hey, you need to get out of here. That's not the devil's voice. That's God talking to you. Get out of here. Whatever it is, God will make a way for escape. If you are tempted, God will always give you an opportunity to leave. That is His promise. And this is what the Scripture says here. 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 13. God will also give you a way to escape that temptation. Now, if you allowed yourself to go so long without filling your mind with the good stuff, without trying to take control of your thoughts, you might see that exit door and decide not to go out. But that exit door will always be there and give you the chance to leave and get out. Let me read a couple more of these uh, fill in the blanks here. We're not quite all the way there yet. For a person who has truly made Jesus the Lord of their life, the path to sin is a blank process, or it should be. What is that? What is that word to describe that process? It should be a slow process. If you are where you are with the Lord and temptation comes up, you're not going to immediately fall to it. You're going to resist it. And if you put up the resistance and you fight the devil, he'll flee from you. You can draw that out for a long time. And hopefully you, you win the battle before it ever gets beyond that. But if, if the devil's going to chip away at you and chip out, make him earn it. Make it be a slow process. Because you're strong in the Lord and you can do all things through him. And you should fight that battle with every ounce of your being. Number five, we should keep control 
over our blank? What should we take keep control over? Our thoughts. Because our thoughts are either going to bring evil things or they're going to be good things. Things that are virtuous. Things that are of good report. Things that are pure. We're going to think about one thing or another. So we need to keep control. And we blank when we begin to lose control. What is it, what is it that goes in that? When we lose control, we lust when we begin to lose control. You're thinking about that Christian music and then all of a sudden your mind turns to that thing you shouldn't be thinking of. That's what lust is. It's when you begin to lose control and your mind starts going some places that it should not. That is your lust. Think about good things to help you maintain control. Number six, temptation may last a long time before we actually commit sin. James compares it to being blank. Pregnant. Pregnancy is how long, brother? Nine months. Nine months. So the process from from falling into lust, when you begin to lose control of your thoughts, to the moment death comes, is a long process. And he compares it to childbirth, because it's not something that happens quickly. You shouldn't be tempted, and within minutes you're already sinning. You should be stronger than that. So exercise yourself, and put up your defenses, and guard your heart. Wear that armor of God. You start to get tempted, find something to fill your mind. Go grab your Bible and start reading it or start quoting a verse that you know or something. Put up your fight. It should take a long time for the devil to get you if he's going to win a battle over you. Make him earn it. So there's one other kind of sin that I want to mention here because it's in the scripture that we started out reading. And this is a one of the other sins. It's not a secret sin, but this is a very special category of sin. Now, our scripture for today was Psalm 19, from really from verse 7 to 14, but we only read down to the bottom of what was that first page, verse 12. And I'm going to read these two verses that come down that, that follow it. We haven't read these yet. From Psalm 19, verses 13 and 14. The psalmist read, says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Everybody say presumptuous. Presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless. And I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What's a presumptuous sin? A presumptuous sin is a premeditated sin. It's something that you are planning out. You know, temptation, like if you're going in that coffee shop in that example, you know, you're subjecting yourself and putting yourself in a situation where if you don't get yourself out of that situation, you're eventually going to fall. It's eventually going to be birthed from lust and then you're going to birth some sin. And when that sin is finished, it's going to bring death into your life. But you're just like going like a blind man walking in there every day or a blind woman walking in there every day just exposing yourself to the danger and eventually you're going to fall. A presumptuous sin is a little different. A presumptuous sin is you on your mind, you're, you're already there. You are now thinking about, I want to do that sin, and how can I do it? And the wheels in your mind start thinking, well, I think I can tell this little lie, and you might think I'm over here, but really I'm over here. Or you start plotting how you can get what you want. Maybe... You're supposed to be on a strict diet and your spouse is being your conscience and you're, you're trying to keep yourself from getting a disease, liver damage or uh, diabetes or whatever. And so 
You're supposed to be doing a good diet, and you're plotting, and you're thinking, well, I can go to the store, and I can get me some, uh, you know, some cookies or some candy, and I can hide them, and, and then I can do what I want, you know. Or I can, I can, I can go to that coffee shop when I'm not working and when somebody's on vacation or whatever, you know, think about whatever your example is, whatever's closest to you. But when you start plotting in your mind how you can get what you want, you've already lost the battle. Your mind is now focused on charging towards that sin. You are premeditating to do that sin. You're thinking about it before you actually do it. It's not like you just stumble into a devil trap. You're, you're aiming for it. You're wanting to get it. A presumptuous sin. Why is it called a presumptuous sin? Here's an argument that the devil might present to you. The devil might say, yeah, you know it's sin, but you know God loves you and He'll forgive your sin, so you can do that sin and then you can ask forgiveness and God will forgive you later. Now, go to it, boy. Or go to it, girl. And ask that devil. You are presuming that you can sin today and be forgiven tomorrow. Presumption is taking something for granted. Say, oh, I live in that. I live under God's grace. God will forgive me. So I can do this sin and he'll forgive me. I can ask him to forgive me when I get home. I can go, I can go do this thing and then I'll be right back in good standing with God, no problem. You're presuming a lot. First of all, you're presuming that you're going to still be alive to ask God to forgive you later. Be careful. This is dangerous. Presumptuous sins. There's several scriptures in the Old Testament I could have brought up about presumptuous sin. And this is the kind of sin that God wanted to rid the person from existence. Destroy them to get them from out of the camp. This is serious kind of stuff. When you are plotting and you are aiming and deciding in your mind that you're going to sin and you're going to figure out how to do it and get away with it, and then I'll ask God to forgive me later. That's like, you know, being a bank robber and, you know, hey, this is my getaway car. I'm going to take the goodies and then we'll get away and then I'll get back in God's good favor. I'll just ask him, Lord, forgive me. He always forgives me. That's a, that's a lie from the devil. When you are sinning and you're thinking, you have those kind of thoughts. Bible talks about crucifying Jesus afresh. You're putting Jesus to an open shame when you do this sort of thing. There remains no more sacrifice for your sin, Scripture will go on to say. A presumptuous sin is something you definitely want to avoid. It's one of those other sins that is really bad. Don't find yourself in that place where you're plotting to figure out a way to get to that sin that you desperately want. You're not only not putting out the fight, you're actively working against, you know, you're, you're tossing the armor into, into the paper shredder. Get, get, you get rid of everything. You're getting really far away from God when you have a presumptuous sin in your heart. So the question was, does that mean you still go to heaven if you repent for other sins? And we need to repent of our sins. Somewhere along the path, and hopefully not in the presumptuous sense of we got what we wanted, now it's time to repent, but before we actually sin. And God gives us that exit door, that way that we can get out of temptation and escape it because there's no excuse. God won't put more temptation on you than you can bear. And when that exit door shows up and you go out that exit door and you say, God, forgive me. Confess your sins before the Lord. The last scripture is 1 John 1 and 7 to 9 from New King James. If we walk in the light as He in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Everybody say all. All sin. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are human beings that are not perfect. We live in a fallen world and we have effectively fallen bodies. Eventually, one of these days, God's going to give us a new body that will be perfect. But we live kind of on the fence and we're balanced. Teeter totter because we are redeemed and regenerated inside, but we carry around this fallen flesh. And so we have to fight this battle. We have to put things in our mind that are good, because otherwise our, mind, our heart's going to put some thoughts in our mind that are not good. We need to control our thoughts so that our thoughts don't control us and become lust. We need to make the devil earn every inch of ground if he's going to eventually defeat us. And there'll be times when he will. But we need to make him earn every inch of ground that he has. Put up the fight. Fight him like it's your... You know, put a bulldog hold into your... Grip to God, your connection to God. Put a bulldog hold in that and don't let the devil get an inch without earning every bit of it. Fight him every step of the way. But if we say that we always win those fights and we don't have any sin, then we're a liar. We all lose them. Once in a while, we're going to lose them. Once in a while, we're going to do something bad. And it don't matter if it's a little white lie. It don't matter if it's stealing a little thing out of a store. It don't matter if it's a big thing. Go to God and confess our sins. Because if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number seven. Presumptuous sin is special because it is blank. Premeditated. You sin willfully and intentionally, taking for granted that you can ask forgiveness later. And number eight, if we blank our sins, God is faithful to forgive us. What is that? Confess. If there is anyone here today that has a sin in your heart, and you know that the devil has been winning out. Today is the day to look for that exit door. This is the moment when you say, Devil, I've had enough. I'm not going to let you take another inch. And, you, and I'm going to go to God and confess that today. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. I don't want to know what anybody's been up to, but if there's something that is in your that's been in there, it's been in your heart, and it's something that you're dealing with right now, and the devil's been trying to get you to go one way, but you know God wants you to go another way. Slip your hand up real quick. Put your hand down. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now in, in his name. Lord, we know that we have done you wrong. We know that we have failed you. We know that we have secret sins in our heart. Lord, forgive us of those right now. And Lord, for the sin that's been with us for a while, that we have given over to temptation, and we have placed ourselves in this position of letting this thing come between you and us, Lord. Father, I pray that you would forgive me right now. Lord, as we're all saying a prayer like this, if we if we have that need today, Lord, Father, the words I know are going like this. Father, forgive me for where I have failed you. Lord, cleanse me right now. Lord, I renounce my sin. And Lord, from this day forward, Lord, I pray that you would let me be able to fight this battle once again. That you would Give me the strength to resist better the next time. 
And Lord, I pray that you would fill my mind with good things. Help me fill my mind with good things, Lord, so that I can keep up the fight and make the devil earn it next time. Lord, I've given up, but Lord, right now I give in. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. Thank you for forgiving me, Lord. And I trust in your word that says you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Thank you right now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a need to say that prayer and you said that prayer, then God has forgiven you. And it's time to start this battle over and fight Him every step of the way. Those things that tempt you, keep your heart from lust by keeping control of your thoughts. Take control of them every day. And don't let it get to the point to where you start going down that birthing process. Don't, don't, don't get yourself pregnant with sin. But let's fight him every step of the way in every situation. Let's put God first and follow the law of the Lord. The law of love, to love our neighbors, ourselves, and the Lord love God with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And follow the words of Jesus. Amen.